good afternoon. Thanks to everyone present in Google Meet and YouTube uh, for participating of this seminar. Uh, today we have the pleasure of having uh, Felipe Andrade Santos, who is director of the Clay Center Observatory at Dexter Southfield and a research associate at the Harvard Smith Sonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, Philip, thank you uh, for accepting this invitation. Uh, and Philippe, he, he got his uh, bachelor in physics and in engineering at USP and Ecole, Technique, Ecole Polytechnique in France, right, Philippe? Yes. And he did his master and PhD here at IAG, working with Professor Gaston. Uh, in the, in, in, during his PhD, he investigated the merger of galaxy clusters. In fact, we were colleagues during uh, this time. And since then, since uh, the 2012, he works uh, at the Harvard. And in 2019, he became the director of the Clay Center Observatory. And his primary uh, research interest is in galaxy clusters. Uh, for example, he uh, measured their masses using them for cosmological studies and uh, studying particle acceleration in galaxy cluster shocks. And today, he's going to present his research on the physics of electron reacceleration in galaxy clusters and the dependency of the selected cluster population on wavelengths. Uh, some of the results he's going to discuss today was highlights in the famous journal Nature Astronomy. And uh, before Philip starts, uh, please, uh, those following the seminar via YouTube, please indicate in the chat of YouTube if you have a question. And those following uh, the seminar in Google Meet, please uh, raise uh, your hands, push the button, uh, raise the hands. And the questions will be directed to Felipe after his presentation. So, Felipe, please, whenever you are prepared, you can start. Thank you very much, Reinaldo. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, so, thanks for having me. Um, let me start now sharing my screen. Just a second. Okay. So can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So I'll be talking about the physics of electron reacceleration galaxy clusters and the dependence of the selected cluster population on wavelength. So as Reinaldo said, I'm the director of the Clay Center Observa Observatory and a research associate at the Harvard uh, Center, uh, Smithsonian Center for, for Astrophysics. So the summary of this talk is highlighted here. So I'll start like by giving a brief introduction about the Clay Center Observatory and just say what I'm doing there since I have so many colleagues and friends here uh, watching this. So I would like to give them a little like uh, perspective of what I'm doing there. Um, then I'll start talking about galaxy clusters, give an introduction uh, about them. And then I'll talk about two works that I've done uh, quite a while ago, like in 2017. And as I discussed with Reinaldo, like I thought it was a great opportunity for me to highlight those works because there are some interesting results there that uh, some of you uh, may find interesting. I may also represent like very shortly um, a, a paper that I posted on archive and was um, there yesterday. So uh, there's a, a fresh out of the oven work that I'll, I'll talk very briefly, but I'll mostly concentrate on work that I did a couple of years ago because I find them um, particularly interest, interesting. Okay, so let me start by actually um, sharing 
like a, the view of the school or the Dexter Southfield School in Brookline. So, so what you're seeing here is the Dexter Southfield School in Brookline, a uh, private school uh, located very close to Boston. Uh, it, it is actually, Brookline is part of the Boston area. Um, you can see Boston there uh, in the background. Uh, where you see all of those like skyscrapers. Um, on, you can see that there's a dome there in the, in the building. So the dome is the clay center observatory. The, the, the telescope is inside that dome over there. Uh, here I have little like uh, um, writings uh, showing where the CFA, the Harvard is Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics is where the MIT is and where the Logan Airport is, just for, for context here. So it's a, a private school nearby uh, some of these uh, uh, famous institutions like uh, for, for astronomy and many other uh, uh, subjects, of course. So here is like a view of the telescope. So it's a 60 centimeters uh, telescope. Um, very good one, actually, like, especially when you think that this telescope is located in a school, not a, in a university. Um, one of my jobs there is public outreach. Uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, we used to have, like, uh, people coming to observe the stars, like planets, like a variety of objects. It was quite interesting. Um, but now, because of the pandemic, what I've been doing is that I've been um, broadcasting that remotely. So you can see the, like my laptop over there, like showing an image of Saturn. So what we do is like, I connect like a camera to the telescope, the camera is attached to, the, to my computer and via Zoom, people from home can actually see what the telescope is pointing at. And here's some pictures that I took over the past uh, uh, summer. Uh, using the telescope, some other telescope, and just a camera. So on the top left, you have the full moon using like a small telescope that I brought home from school. Uh, then you have like a zoom in in the region where Apollo 11 landed. Uh, on the right there, you have Saturn, of course, and Jupiter. And in the, the bottom like uh, panels, you have the new wise comment that was that visit us like last summer. Uh, so let me now move uh, to cluster of galaxies. Oh, by the way, let me go back here. Uh, one of the things I do in the school, other than of course being the director of the telescope, I teach physics, astronomy, and math at the school. So it's quite an opportunity to bring um, also the research that I do. Uh, to those young kids. So, and, and before, before moving to the school, I, I have to admit that I didn't really appreciate that uh, to the extent that I do now. Like, it's quite an interesting job to actually, other than just like uh, do our research, to be able to commu communicate that directly to the kids uh, that in the future, Maybe may become astronomers. So I feel very blessed to have this opportunity at the school. Anyway, let's move on now to cluster of galaxies. So uh, from simulations and, and analytical uh, models, we know that like a region that reaches like a density of roughly 200 times the critical density will be uh, collapsed, right? So defining that, the region that defines a cluster, uh, here we have like the, the average density of the cluster would be roughly 200 times the critical density of the universe at the redshift of the cluster. That leads to a mass, a total mass that is roughly uh, 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 solar masses. And the extension of that region is like a few megaparsecs. So cluster of galaxies are very large objects. Um, it's mostly, um, made of dark matter, 80% of the mass, hot baryons, uh, which constitute 15% of the mass, and cold baryons, uh, which uh, constitute about 5% of the mass. Cold baryons here, you can think of stars and galaxies. The hot baryons is the ICM, the intracluster medium. So this very hot, uh, low density gas that resides between galaxies. 
On the left here, you have a Bell 1689, uh, an amazing uh, lensing uh, cluster, as you can see from the image. Um, so you can see the, the incredible number of galaxies. So a cluster typically has hundreds to thousands of galaxies bound together by gravity. So they're very massive objects, uh, the largest bound structures uh, in the universe. Um, the gas, so let's concentrate now uh, on the hot baryons. So the gas uh, of a galaxy cluster uh, typically has temperatures of 1 to 10 kV. The gas is heated to that temperature as it uh, falls into the cluster potential over billions of years. And the density is very, very low, like a 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3 uh, particles per cubic centimeter. But because of the volumes are like just very large, it, they make up like to 10 to the 13 solar masses in mass. So it's a very, uh, there's a lot of gas in, in galaxy clusters. They do emit in X-rays because of the temperature. And this gas is optically thin, so we can see uh, the X-ray emission from the gas, even from the gas that is behind the other side of the cluster. So, so how, do, how do clusters form, right? So in a lambda CDM uh, cosmological model, um, what you have is like that the primordial quantum fluctuations uh, will create over densities. And then over like billions of years, those over densities will aggregate more matter uh, via mergers and accretion, which uh, in the end will become a cluster of galaxies at the, the current epoch. Um, here you have like some snapshots of the volker springle uh, simulation, the Millennium simulation. So you can see that over time, going from 210 million years old, when the universe was that age, all the way up to the present uh, epoch of the universe, you can see the matter flows through those filaments, uh, accreting and, and merging uh, onto the highest density regions, uh, forming galaxy clusters. And therefore, because they form late in the history of the universe, and that's because they're very massive, they are dynamically an object, meaning that they show evidence of their recent like uh, activity. Uh, here, I show uh, a halo mass function that is related to what I just described. It. So basically, what you're seeing here on the top left panel uh, is that you have the number of collapsed objects as a function of the mass for different redshifts. So you can see that for redshifts of like uh, 16, for instance, long time ago, you don't have objects that are with uh, massive. They only appear in this plot uh, at lower redshifts. Uh, so only about z equals 0 0.5 to z equals 0, you have a significant density of those like 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15 solar masses objects. And those are the clusters. On the right here, you have like a simulated image that I created uh, using that halo uh, mass function. So basically what I did, uh, I populated that like randomly by selecting um, the expected number of clusters using the halo mass function. So the, it's color coded, so red means uh, high redshift, um, and then blue, more like intermediate redshift, and, and, and whitish uh, are the nearby objects. You can see also that they become bigger, uh, of course, because they're, and, uh, the upper end, the size of the, this object become higher uh, because they're closer. But this, uh, by the way, this image was created for the Lynx X-ray Observatory that is like being under uh, study now by the by a group of teams, especially at Harvard, the Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So basically, the Lynx telescope is like a is a study project that may become the next Chandra uh, telescope. Uh, and the, re the result of that, like the NASA will decide that next month. So, and, and when a few years back, when I was at CFA, I worked with Alexei Viklini, who is the, the, me, the, 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 the lead scientist on that project. Uh, and he asked me to create that image. So 
just to study like what links would see in terms of like galaxy clusters. Anyway, so moving forward uh, now, let me talk about the sunyev zeldovich effect. So here you have a uh, nice picture of, bo of both Hashid Sunyev and, and Zeldovich there. Uh, Sunyev is the one standing up, by the way. So they, they predicted that cluster of galaxies would have a very interesting effect on the CMB. So basically, let me explain here um, what it is. So we all know that the CMB is very well fit by a black body spectrum. Um, anywhere you point your telescope in the, if it's a microwave telescope, like you'll be able to see like that beautiful black body spectrum. That's what Cole, WMAP and Planck did. Um, you can see the WMAP uh, image of the temperature fluctuations. So it looks like there's a lot of fluctuations there and there is, but in the scale of 10 to the minus five, okay? So it's pretty smooth and the fluctuations happens on a very small scale of 10 to the minus five. So the fluctuations on temperature are very small. So it's very, very homogeneous. Um, now let's think about the CMB photons that are traveling uh, from the time of like uh, recombination when the universe was really young uh, and, and photons uh, were able to travel freely for the first time. So those, those photons have been traveling since redshift of like a thousand. And when they encounter a cluster of galaxies, what happens is that they are inverse Compton scattered um, by the hot electrons in the ICM of clusters. So they gain some energy as they encounter the hot electrons in the cluster of galaxies. But how much energy do they gain? So the calculations on top there will show you that. So typically, typically like, uh, if you think about the optical depth, uh, it's about like 10 to the minus two, meaning that like one cluster in a hundred crossing, uh, sorry, one, sorry, one photon, photon in a hundred, we crossing the ICM of a galaxy cluster, we will encounter this hot electron that will boost its temperature or its energy. Uh, and by how much? The second line there, you have that delta uh, nu over nu equals 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the minus two, meaning that the boost in energy will be of one percent two. So you have like a one percent probability of encountering uh, one of those electrons, and if that encounter happens, that will boost the energy by just one percent. Combining both effects, you have a 10 to the minus four. Uh, signal there. But 10 to the minus 4 signal on top of 10 to the minus 5 fluctuations is an easily detected signal. So that's how we use this effect, this sunyev zeldovich effect, to actually find cluster of galaxies. So we, so I'm going to describe that in the next slide in more detail, but look here on the right top panel. What happens is like you have a shift on the black body spectrum of the CMB due to the sunya zeldovich effect. So they gain energy, they move to the right in that frequency, uh, that uh, intensity frequency plot. Okay, so what happens? If you look at 44 gigahertz, for instance, you're gonna see a decrement in the signal, uh, all the way up to 143 on that plot, but at 217 gigahertz, the, the right top um, plot there, you can see that there is no uh, change in, in intensity, in flux. And above that, there is an increment. So below, again, so below 217 gigahertz, you're gonna see a decrement in the flux. Above 100, uh, 217 gigahertz, you're gonna see an increment in flux. By looking for that pattern, and that happens, by the way, at the same location. So if you have an instrument, and that has several channels uh, looking at different frequencies, you can look for this pattern. You can look for this increment above 217 gigahertz and decrements below 217 gigahertz. If you find that, it's very likely that you found a galaxy cluster. So that's how the Planck mission using several channels that you see there like 44, 70, 100, 143, 217, 353, and 545 gigahertz, 
That's how they were able to generate their early Sunni Avs back in 2011. So back in 2011, they released a catalog of clusters that were detected using this signal, this Sunni Avs signal. Uh, so Christine Jones who was my uh, supervisor at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics uh, from 2012 until roughly 2015-16. She was PI on this X XVP program. Uh, XVP means like X-ray visionary program. That's a Chandra program to observe uh, objects that will have like a, a large contribution to science, uh, X-ray science in general. So she had a proposal of one megasecond to actually make complete the sample of clusters that was the, the, the clusters that were detected by the Planck mission. So Planck detected about 189 clusters in this first catalog, and she truncated the redshift of the clusters to 0 0.35. So there were 165 clusters uh, up below a uh, redshift of 0, 0 0.35. Uh, and then she looked for the existing data on the Chandra catalog and made sure that in her proposal, every single cluster had at least 10,000 counts. So we could characterize the clusters in terms of temperature, mass, and so on. So she was um, awarded this project and then Chandra was able to perform her observations, and we got the data to do the works that I'm gonna show in the next few line, slides. So let me present now uh, this first work that I did in 2000, uh, that was published in 2017, but I was working on that for a long time before that. So it's called the cool core fraction in X-ray versus SZ selected clusters using general observations. So what it is, is like, uh, so first let me start by defining what is a cool core cluster. That's a very important uh, point to start. So a cool core cluster is a cluster that in the core, as the name says, has a low temperature. So basically there are many ways of defining that, but let's go with the simple one. So a cluster that in the very core has a low temperature compared to the average temperature is a cool core cluster. In surface brightness, like uh, what you will see is that a peak of emission because the temperature is low, but the density is high. So the pressure is roughly constant. So the density is high, but the X-ray uh, surface brightness is proportional to the in, um, integral along the line of sight of the density squared. So if you have a, a low temperature in the core, the density will be higher and it will be very X-ray luminous. That's what you see on the right uh, plot over there. On the left plot, what you see is like a known cool core cluster, a core, uh, cluster that doesn't have that drop in temperature in the core or that excess in, in density, therefore, in surface brightness. By the way, those images uh, were created by Gaston. Um, so I have shown this image so many times now. Um, it was on my thesis, many talks, like so it's, that's a very plot showing the differences in, in surface brightness of cool core clusters and known cool core clusters. Okay, so how did we uh, do this work? So, so, so now that we know what a cool core cluster is, uh, let's understand what I wanted to do with this work. I wanted to know what is the fraction of those cool core clusters in samples that were selected differently. So the first sample was the ESZ sample, the Planck sample that was selected using the SUNY Avzeldoft effect. That's what you see, the clusters that you see here on the left. left. The other sample was an X-ray flux limited sample that was um, selected, of course, using clusters that were So they were selected differently. Uh, so the goal of this, this, this work is very simple. Look at the clusters on the left. Uh, we're gonna apply a metric to measure how many of those clusters are cool core clusters. 
Then look at the clusters on the right. We're going to do the same thing, apply a metric to determine how many of those clusters are cool core clusters. And let's see if there's a difference between them, OK? Um, so the Planck mission had 164, uh, sorry, the, the Planck mission's ESZ sample had 164 clusters. The X-ray flux limited sample had 100 clusters. They had an intersection of 49 clusters. Um, here we, you see like two plots of the uh, frequency that you find uh, of clusters uh, as a function of redshift. So you can see that the ESZ is pretty flat compared to the X-ray selection. And that's because it's much easier in X-ray to select those clusters that, that are nearby. Um, because of the, uh, the, they would be more, uh, they would, like the, if you apply a flux limit, the, the clusters that are nearby uh, are more numerous because they, they can be less massive. Uh, on the other hand, the ESC uh, sample um, is pretty flat. And the reason for that is that the um, photons that are, uh, inverse Compton scattered by the electrons, meaning like the zuniev zeldov uh, uh, effect is independent of the cluster redshift. And by the way, Gaston is the one who actually taught me the reason that is. And the reason is that the photons are not coming from the clusters, the cluster. They just get like a boost in energy. The, cluster, the, the redshifts are all coming from a red from the red shift of recombination, which is about a thousand. So the Sunni Abzeldov has this very interesting um, uh, particularity, which is like it's it's roughly independent of the red shift. You can detect them independent of the red shift. Um, now, if you look at on the right, they tend to be more massive. It's just like uh, like a an effect of the flux limit that we use it for the X-ray clusters. If we had used like a higher uh, X-ray uh, limit, uh, we could change the distribution of masses for the X-ray clusters. But anyway, uh, so now we know what we have to do. We need to measure the fraction of cool core clusters in these this two samples and see how they compare. So um, ideally, we would just look at a cluster with a lot of counts, make like um, a temperature profile, and that's what you see on the bottom there. So you have on the bottom right, the temperature profile of a Bell uh, 2204. Uh, this cluster has been observed by Chandra for long exposures, has a lot of data, so we can do a very nice temperature profile. You can see that it's a cool core cluster directly from the temperature profile. On the other hand, look at the one on top. That's um, uh, Planck G O O O, and I can remember the rest like a telephone number. Uh, but anyway, that cluster doesn't have that many counts, so we can only extract the temperature in two regions. So for a cluster like that, it's very hard to know if the temperature drops or not because look at the uncertainties at the uh, at the temperature there. So we need to use some other way of measuring uh, the, the if a, to determine if a, uh, if a cluster is a cool core or not. So we're going to use this concentration metric. What we're going to do is go, we're going to measure the ratio of the number of counts within 15% of R500 and then within R500. By the way, R500 here is the, the radius that defines a region around the cluster where the average density is 500 times the critical density of the universe. But anyway, uh, we know now how to actually measure, like we have a metric for determine if, determining if the cluster is a cool core or not. Uh, and think about that. If the cluster is a cool core, what is going to happen with that ratio? That ratio is going to be high, because there will be a lot of counts coming from the inner region. If the cluster is not a cool core cluster, that number is, is going to be low. Let me go back to Gaston's uh, plot here. You can see that in the core, there's a lot of emission in a cool core cluster. If you make a ratio of the number of counts from, coming from the, cool, from the central region uh, to, the, to the whole extent of the cluster, you're going to see a, a high number there. 
If you look on the left, you're not going to see the high number because there is not that excess of counts coming from the center. That's why this concentration metric is a good one. So we did that for the plank and the X-ray sample and look what we found. So here we have a ratio of 0 0.4 that we use it to define what is a cool core and a non-cool core cluster. The X-ray sample had about 62% of the clusters uh, above that uh, ratio of 0 0.4, meaning 62% of the clusters in the X-ray sample were cool core clusters. On the other hand, if you look at the Planck numbers, you get only 30%. So among the, the plant clusters, uh, only 30% had uh, the ratio above 0 0.4. So we have two times more uh, cool core clusters uh, in, a cluster, in a sample that was selected using an X-ray criteria than the plant one. Um, and, and, and the question here is like, why is that? Okay, so in, in this paper, we were able to show in a very simplistic way and like a sort of like a toy model why that was the case. Uh, and it's not that complicated to see. So basically what we're gonna need is to understand the mass function, the number of collapsed objects above a certain mass, uh, understand how the mass and luminosity relate. So we have a mass luminosity relation here, the second uh, equation that you see there. And then we have to understand that for a fixed mass, for a fixed mass, that's important uh, a phrase there, like uh, clusters, uh, cool core clusters tend to be more X-ray luminous. Uh, and that makes sense for a fixed mass. If you have that excess of emission from the core, you have more luminosity. So for a fixed mass, cool core clusters are more luminous. So that's the important thing. And we're gonna see that like, the overpopulation should just be given by that equation, L to the power of gamma over beta. Uh, by the way, like when I published that paper a uh, few years later, Bill Foreman, that many of you know uh, from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, was giving a talk um, and he asked me to show him uh, exactly why that equation looks like that. Uh, so I wrote him these uh, calculations here. I don't want to go through the, the entire uh, set of like equations and what I want you to look is the following. If you look at the plot that I have there, so you can see that a cool core cluster, the line, the, 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 lumino the luminosity, the mass luminosity relation for a cool core cluster, is offset from the new known cool core cluster. So basically what you have is that if you have a flux limit, meaning that they need to be above a certain like uh, flux, and for a small redshift range, you can translate that into luminosity. Uh, so they need to be above a certain luminosity. What you see is that uh, for known cool core clusters, the mass threshold for that will be higher than for the cool core clusters, meaning that some clusters that have lower masses, but they are cool core, they can, uh, they, they, they do match the criteria and they are included in the sample. So a cool core cluster with a lower mass will be included. So now you have an extra population of those cool core clusters in this X-ray selected sample. Therefore, you should expect to have more cool core clusters in X-ray selected samples. And that's exactly what we see. So uh, using the numbers like for beta and gamma, we get that the over density there, delta that you see over there, should be something like 2.1 to 2.7 times, uh, meaning that there is an overpopulation of more than two a factor of two of cool core clusters in an X-ray selected sample. And that's exactly what we observe. We observe, you can see here, about two times more cool core clusters in X-ray uh, in an X-ray sample. So basically the message here is that there is nothing weird with the fact that you see more cool core clusters in an X-ray sample. Anyway, so now moving on, uh, to a work that I just uh, posted on archive 
uh, recently. So it was on archive yesterday, by the way. So I encourage you to go check that, that paper. It's quite an inter interesting one. Of course, I'm biased, but there's, there has been a lot of work on, uh, to actually have this, this, this work done. So uh, what you're seeing in this paper is the observation of that same sample, the ESG sample. But what we did in this time is that we re-extracted the masses of clusters using the more precise X-ray center coming from the X-ray observations that we had due to the XVP uh, program of Christian Jones. So because of that program, we were able to measure the X-ray position with much better accuracy than, uh, and precision than uh, what the Planck uh, cluster can do. Uh, the Planck beam is of the, uh, the, the full width half maximum of the, chan of the Planck telescope, uh, is of the order of arc minutes. And the resolution of Chandra is of the order of arc seconds. So using a new center for the clusters, we were able, and that was thanks to like the Jean-Baptiste Melan and, and, and others uh, that were specialists in doing that, that we were able to re-extract the Planck masses that were published in the past. So the Planck masses were very like became very famous like as a reference for for masses of cluster of galaxies. And we were able to re-extract those masses using the newly, uh, uh, the new X-ray centers and sizes. So that's what we see uh, right here. So I'm gonna go brief here. I encourage you to look at the archive uh, uh, from yesterday. But what we see here, like, so let's focus first on the bottom plots. Uh, so what you see there is that the mass, so you can see there, like MSZ, PSZ2, meaning the Planck catalog masses. On the right side, you see like M, MSZ, PSX. PSX means like the re-extracted masses that we derive. Uh, you can see that the slope is the same, 0 0.93 for both cases, but the scatter decreases. Okay, so by using the new X-ray center, we were able to decrease the scatter between uh, the mass measured by Planck and the mass measured by Chandra. And the mass measured by Chandra actually was done by our group. Uh, I was the, the lead on that work. So I led like the, the extraction of the masses. So what you're seeing there is like our re-extracted masses for the Planck catalog against the masses that like we derive and the agreement uh is is quite remarkable um x the the x-ray masses the channel masses tend to be higher by like five to seven percent on top what you see there uh is the ysz which is the compton parameter uh for the sunni the adopted fact uh, compared against the Yx parameter, which is the equivalent of the Compton parameter for SZ, but now for X-rays. So when you compare, when you compare the both, when you compare both, uh, you see, let's see the, the plot on the right. If it's plotted in arc minute square, in units of arc minute square, or apparent flux, you get a slope there of 0 0.89 and like an plus or minus 0 0.1. When you convert that to megaparsecs, it's the same relationship basically. But when you, when you redistribute the points and get that in units of megaparsec square, it's a different quantity actually. Uh, it's now intrinsic properties because it doesn't depend on the, the distance anymore of the cluster. What you get is that the slope is 0 0.96 plus or minus 0 0.3, 0 0.3. So what we were able to do in this paper for the first time is to show analytically that that was expected. So we knew that there was a difference in the slope going from 0 0.89 to 0 0.96 in this case uh, for over a decade. But we didn't know exactly why that was the case that when you display the same, roughly the same relationship in different units, these slopes were different. 
So in this paper, we show analytically that every time that you make a redistribution of the data, you get a slope that is closer to unit, and uh, this, the dispersion about the, the best fit relationship will be higher. So that's exactly what we predict. But I don't go, don't want to go any further on that. There's another work that I want to focus. Uh, I encourage you to look at this this paper that was published and uh, posted yesterday on archive. It has 28 pages, um, I think 15 figures, like a lot of tables. There's a lot of information there that might be used for many of you uh, who work with cluster of galaxies. Okay, so moving on now to shocks, acceleration, and radio emission coming from cluster of galaxies. So uh, what you have there uh, is Max 717 on, on the top one and the toothbrush cluster on the bottom one. You can see why it's called toothbrush, but because the relic there, the, the red emission that you see, looks like a toothbrush. Um, anyway, I'll get to that point later. Uh, when you have relativistic electrons, so electrons with very high energy, magnetic fields, uh, you get radio emission, okay, by, um, and it's just synchrotron emission. Um, so these relics that you see there is basically tracing regions that have a lot of very high uh, energy electrons and magnetic fields. Um, these are called radio relics. Um, and from the past, we have seen that in the regions where you find those relics, you find also shocks. So when clusters merge, they do create like shocks. So what you're seeing there uh, is a relic, but if you look in x-rays, you're probably gonna see like a shock front right where you find the relic. So the question was for a long time now, why is that the case? Why where you find shocks, you also find radio relics? So let's move on and try to explain that uh, in more detail. By the way, this is Reinhard von Weary, my good friend uh, from, from the Netherlands. Uh, he's now a professor at Leiden University. Um, and he's holding there, um, as you can see, a Mac tree uh, razor and a toothbrush. He's the one who coined uh, the toothbrush cluster. That's the reason why I took the picture of him. By the way, and, and let me go briefly here, funny story. So we were uh, in Dallas for the AAS general meeting in 2017. So January, 2017. At the time we were supposed to go back to Boston, to, to work at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Um, what happened is like we had a snowstorm in Boston. So our flight got canceled. So there was like a very chaotic uh, um, attempt from all of us to go back. Uh, we were calling, um, I think it was United Airlines, like trying to reschedule our flights. And Ryan was able to do that. So he ran to the airport, uh, checked in his luggage, and just a few minutes later, they told him he was not going to fly. So he wanted his luggage back, but they said, we cannot do that. You're gonna have your luggage here until you actually fly back. So we couldn't get his luggage. He had no clothes, no toothbrush, no razor, nothing. So I went with him shopping, uh, and that's, that was taken to Walmart, uh, because he didn't have like an Uber on the Uber application on his phone. So I had to go with him and then that's when I took that picture. Just like a fun fact about that picture. Anyway, he is one of the best um, uh, radio astronomers working on, on cluster of galaxies in, in the world. Like he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, and I had the pleasure to work with him like for a few years at the CFA. Anyway. Uh, so now, what is the origin of the radio emission that you see there, that like uh, reddish uh, part of the images that you're seeing there? What is the origin of that? So there are two main competing uh, scenarios. One is shock acceleration, the other one, reacceleration. So shock acceleration is basically particles being accelerated by multiple crossing of the shock front. So they, 
they they go back and forth uh, in the shock front and they gain energy by doing that sort of like a firm type um, acceleration process uh, but the problem is like how can you actually boost the energy of the icm electrons from kv energy to gv energy so they can emit that synchrotron uh, radiation so it's very hard to explain that boost in energy using that mechanism. Another mechanism is this second one that you see there, reacceleration. So if you have, it's very similar to the first one, but you start with a population of like fossil relativistic electrons. So if somehow you can have the population of electrons with very high energy that just need a little boost in energy, to be able to reach the threshold that we can observe them with our radio telescopes, you could explain that. So you have these two competing theories, and we were trying to, to determine which one was causing actually the radio emission in cluster of galaxies, the radio relics. So that's where a Bell 3411 comes into play. So that's a cluster of galaxies at redshift 0.17 and um, that is going through like a merger you can see that uh, it has a bullet like shape so that's because of the merger there are shocks in this cluster and there is a beautiful radio relic in this cluster so we observe that with chandra gmrt and subaru and what we observe it is first that uh it's a bimodal cluster so you have like Galaxies mainly in two regions in that cluster, a Bell 3411, a Bell 3412. Um, but the interesting part comes when you look at X-rays. So when you look in the X-rays, that's what you see here. You see the, the arrows pointing in the south, southern part of the cluster. That's where we actually see that jump in surface brightness. And that's what we believe is a shock front. So the shock front happens to coincide. Look at the bottom sorry the top uh, right panel there so the shock from uh, happens to coincide with the shock uh, the, the shock from happens to coincide with the relic so you have a relic there and the shock from is where the relic is and that's not the first time we've seen that as i mentioned like that was known for quite a while that relics and shocks are are on the same region in the sky what was interesting that we did is that we actually measure the spectral index map of this relic there. So the relic that you see there, like AGN, JET, foreground, those so that, that plot on the right there, what we did, look at the uh, plot labeled B, the one in the center. So what you have there is like in the region of the AGN, the, 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 the spectral index map is green. Then it becomes blue and then greens again, green again. So let's see what that corresponds. Look at the top uh, right, uh, the top plot, the, the one of the flux as a function of the frequency. So you have that the radial spectral index will be flat and here labeled as green. When, look, at, look there, it was going to be flat. So if you read the first bullet point on the left, it's gonna be an acceleration site. So meaning that it's going to be flat because energy is being injected locally. Now, if there is no source of injection of energy, it's going to be steep because electrons will lose energy very fast at higher frequencies. So it's going to look very steep. So by looking if this radio spectral index, the slope of the curve basically, is different uh, at different locations, you know where the injection of energy is happening. So let's go back to plot B uh, on the bottom. So you have at the AGN location, it's green, meaning that it's an acceleration site. Makes sense. Uh, it's an AGN. So it's injecting high energy electrons into the ICM. Now, after that, in the uh, jet uh, region, you see it blue, meaning that it loses energy as it travels through the jet. But when you look at the shock, it becomes green again, meaning that the shock is injecting energy again. So you have injection of energy first, 
where you have the AGN. Then it loses energy, and then you have shocks injecting energy again. So that's the signature that we were looking for. And the amazing thing is that the shock there, the relic, is connected to the AGN. That was the first time that we saw that. And that is literally the smoking gun. We're seeing where the electrons are coming from. So it points to the scenario where very likely the radio relics are created by reacceleration. You have first the electrons being accelerated by supermassive black hole, and then later being boost, their, their energies are boosted by the shock that is traveling through the cluster. On the A plot, uh, plot there, you have the redshift, sorry, you have the spectrum of that AGN. So that's interesting. I, I contacted Vinicius Placo and Rafael Santucci, and they were able to use SOAR to actually measure the redshift of that galaxy. And the, and the reason we did that, we want to make sure that the, the, the redshift of that, that particular galaxy belong to the cluster, and it does. So it's the same redshift of the cluster. On the right plot there, the polarization map, you can see that the shocks polarizing um, the radio emission, uh, which is also expected from, from the scenario of reacceleration. So that was a very interesting work. We knew that uh, the shocks and the relics were uh, associated. And for the first time, we were able to see the smoking gun. We saw that the electrons that were being, um, that were emitting that like radio emission, uh, which we call a radio relic, was actually uh, were actually coming from you know, supermassive black hole in AGN. Um, uh, and this work uh, made the cover of the first um, Nature Astronomy magazine in 2017. So we were very um, blessed to have our image on the very first issue of the magazine. Um, and the work, this work also had a lot of like uh, fuss, let's put it this way. So here is me and Rhino on the right uh, image there. Uh, we wrote a little piece for a Chandra blog. Uh, then like uh, we had like uh, me talking to Ecole Polytechnique where I studied in France. And then Mensageiro, Mensageiro Sideral, uh, uh, Salvador Nogueira, who many of you know, uh, wrote a piece on that work, and Jornal da USP, uh, and so on. So that was that was very interesting work, and had a lot of like people talking about that a, a couple of years ago. And that's why I wanted to talk about that in case some of you uh, missed that. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Felipe. It was very, really, very clear talk. Uh, now we we open for the questions. Uh, to the first, uh, Maria Victoria, please go ahead. Yes, hi. Thank you, Felipe, for your for your talk. Uh, I am. Uh, I found really interesting this this um, results on the radio relics. I have a question related to the polarization what's the polarization degree that you measure in this object and also you mentioned that you would expect the polarization in the scenario of reacceleration but why not in in the case of only acceleration oh the so I think the polarization would be expected in both cases. Yeah, because I guess this is coming actually from the synchrotron emission. Exactly. The polarization would be expected in both cases. And the degree there is about 30 to, to 50% polarization. Okay. But and, the uh, polarization, yes, would be expected in both cases. And can I do another question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I, I was wondering that. Uh, would you expect that all the radio relics are actually coming from this interaction from an AGN with the shock? Um, not necessarily in the, in the sense that 
the AGN is still injecting the electrons. So I think that's the reason it was so hard to actually see that smoking gun because mm -hmm. we caught that in the act of happening. Um, so the agent could be dead for, for a while and the electrons still be there like sitting at very high energy, but not for very long though, because we know that the high energy electrons will lose energy very fast. So, yeah. but it's very hard to find the moment that you see the connection happening to the, to the AGN. So I think that's why it was so hard to actually um, be able to spot that. Like we've seen those relics in many other clusters. We never actually saw that connection so clearly. Yes. Yeah. That's, really, that's really amazing. Yes, really amazing. And do you remember uh, what's the magnetic field that you need for 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 the synchrotron emission in this case? Uh, about micro gauss. Okay. Like. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Betty, please go ahead. Oi, oui, Felipe. Uh, very, very interesting talk with um, several subjects. I I have a couple of questions, and uh, one regards the the last uh, paper, of course, because you talk about acceleration reacceleration, mm -hmm. and then okay, we, we uh, as you mentioned, there are several relics that have been observed with evidence of synchrotron and. The, the 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 shock the shock uh, picture is there, without any necessary um, evidence of uh, of you know a smoking gun in the sense that you do yes. not have to actually you do not need to have an AGN to provide a first population of uh, in, in principle right because in most of these relics or, 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 or what you see is the merging and then in this merging you see a shock front and in principle this shock front has uh, you know compression magnetic field and energy yeah. um, stored enough to accelerate the particles over there and then you you, you have direct shock acceleration either either uh, uh, either uh, diffusive shock acceleration, right? Yes, yeah. yeah. DSA yeah. or yeah. the drift, the shock drift acceleration. Yes. And the difference between the two mechanisms is essentially the orientation of the magnetic field. Because if the magnetic field is mostly parallel to the shock front, then drift acceleration may prevail, rather than if if the magnetic field is mostly parallel, uh, uh, perpendicular, then the the diffusive shock acceleration will be very very efficient i think uh, but anyways the the fact that in this source you guys have found this you know this connection between two different acceleration centers i mean the uh, first acceleration by an agn and then you have this smoking gun and then you see the continuation or re-acceleration in 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 the I think this is amazing because you you can identify these two centers of of, of acceleration, but I, I I don't believe or I don't think that this is a very common in most of the merging processes. Of course, if there is a a local uh, radio galaxy over there, th this will be helpful. But sometimes you only have the evidence of a, of the shock of the merging, and then yeah. you have acceleration over there right so can you comment on this on this aspect and uh, the, the the other the, the question i mean because this was a comment but my question is from these observations could you distinguish if it was really shock drift acceleration or diffusive shock acceleration based on the magnetic field orientation and and uh, you know studies combining radio and um, and x-ray uh, uh, images and uh, observations. Do, do, do you have an, uh, an idea on this, or or you guys could not distinguish uh, between the two processes in this source specifically? So, so to comment, the first comment. Um, so indeed, like this is the first time we see the connection. Most of the relics, if not all of the other relics, we don't see the connection. But like uh, what we found in this cluster is that we had this connection, and we see and we see that like reacceleration is a possible mechanism. It doesn't rule out the other ones, 
but it shows that reacceleration is possible. The other thing to like related to what I just said to Maria is that um, the AGN could have injected the electrons. Mm -hmm. The AGN is very uh, like, uh, let me put it this way, unstable uh, mechanism, which can be turned on and off, like depending on the supply uh, for the electrons. So, so it's very intermittent. So you could see an agent that is off right now and, and also have the electrons that were recently injected by the agent. So the fact that we caught the, the, the agent actually injecting uh, at the same time that the shock was reaccelerated, uh, reaccelerating the electrons was very, very like a very fortunate uh, yeah, of course. Uh, event for us. Uh, um, but but it's it's very hard to know if indeed like uh, all of them require the AGN injection injecting uh, the the electrons or not. But well, we know that we have evidence of reacceleration happening at least for one cluster and now apparently there has been other clusters where that has been also be, being found uh, on the second question um i'm not the specialist in the radio emission and and like rhino von Meering is uh, so uh but but i think that from the data we have uh we wouldn't be able to do that because Mainly because the group of people working on that project uh, had some of the uh, the people, the, 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 truly the, the the specialists on that field, and nobody nobody comment on that. So I don't think you can actually distinguish distinguish from DSA or uh, S uh, SDA um, from the data of the polarization that we have we got. Right. Okay. Okay, um, and the other, the other, actually, it's a, a question for you because in the beginning of your talk, you sh you showed the the center, the the college where you were you were teaching, and you have yeah. this observatory. It's, it's an it is an amazing place, and not far from from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and from CFA. So, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, I miss this I miss this region a lot, right? And, and uh, yeah, this, uh, Yes. It's wonderful, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, and yeah. The, the proximity to Cambridge and hey. and to CFA and MIT like makes it very special. We have the students going to MIT, and I have to drive them. By the way, I have to drive a van and bring okay. them to the MIT uh, uh, lab. Like uh, there's yeah. an MIT lab where they actually build CubeSat uh, sat, uh, satellites. You know, yeah. you know those like the small satellites, right? So they right, right. Put them in orbit, but they build the satellite and put it at a very high altitude using a balloon, and wow. the students are involved in that. So, so the yeah, practice MIT and CFA is just like yeah, exactly very, very like a for, very fortunate aspect for those kids. Like, yeah, it's am it's an amazing place. I mean, Boston area with all these. Uh, universities and they, yeah. yeah did you know that my daughter studied in mit i mean uh, the daycare center she attended the daycare center oh when i, I was, know that when i was in cfa doing the postdoc she, she was attending so you know we, it's an amazing area for for kids and for everybody actually for yeah. education and research but yeah it's uh, and this college that you are uh, it's it, it's uh, this is school is is really amazing because you prepare kids uh, from very early ages to exactly. Uh, By the way, like the ki the young the young kids are the the one I have the the the, the let's say the most pleasure t uh, talking to because yeah. it's amazing what the five year old six year old uh, kids can. Have. <laughs> so yeah. the other day I was there talking about uh, any subject in astronomy that they could they want me to to talk about, mm -hmm. and I had such so many nice questions about stellar evolution, uh, yeah. black holes, what yeah. happens when black holes collide, like, and it's funny to see the boys are very destructive. They are always talking about explosions like supernovae and 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 black hole collisions like and things like that. 
And the girls are much more like insightful. They ask about the origins of life, like how did the solar system was formed and, and things like that. So <laughs> it, it's quite quite interesting, quite yeah. interesting job. And you learn a lot as well. Oh, sorry for this. Sorry for this. Learn a lot as well with them, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, Philip. Thanks. I, I think I took too much of your time. There are, Thank you very I, much for your questions. Mm -hmm. yes. No, uh, Juan, please go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Felipe, for your very nice talk. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, with this mechanism that you are uh, proposing uh, for reacceleration of electrons, do you also expect uh, it is possible? Do, does it make sense reacceleration of co cosmic ray protons? Uh, probably this could be constrained with uh, detection or non-detection of gamma rays. Uh, do you know if there is detection in these bands? Uh, what can you say in this direction? So there isn't. So, so it's a good point. There isn't. And that's a puzzling, uh, a puzzle that's really puzzling. A lot of people are working on that, that you don't have these uh, gamma rays detected from the same regions that you would expect from what you just described. So, so it's a very... Very good point. So it's still work to be done on, uh, of course, in every single uh, subject, but uh, it's a puzzle, so. No, thank you. Felipe, I myself have a question. It, it's yeah. uh, uh, following more or less the line that Bet was asking uh, about turbulence, uh, maybe it can, uh, it is also related to the way that the electrons are accelerated, but also it's always uh, something that uh, uh, the properties of the turbulence in, in the cluster can tell us a lot about the uh, how the plasma behaves there. Uh, do you think it's possible from this data to extract some information about this, at least in this ratio of the shock acceleration, I don't know, by modeling the the shock, the diffusion? Do you think it's possible to extract some information about turbulence? So I don't think that with the Chandra data, we can do that and, and, and the data we have. Like, but I know that Itomi, the X-ray satellite that was launched and failed like just after a uh, few, few weeks, I think, uh, they had a calorimeter and an amazing spectral resolution. So they were able to put some constraints on turbulence of the of the gas flow. So I'll try to check what what the paper is exactly, so I can forward that to you. Okay. There are also there are also can I can I make a comment on this? There are also the the amazing observations by the Italian group of uh, Govoni, um, uh, Federica Govoni, and uh, Germans as well, Wenzelin. These guys also have several, uh, they have uh, observations, they combine observations in different wavelengths and they extract a lot of information on, on turbulence and on particle acceleration as well and compare with the numerical simulations. So I, I think these observations also, you know, this, this source, this, uh, this region that Felipe uh, and colleagues have observed is, is also, I'm sure, is also target of of uh, of these uh, these kind of studies and including by Brunette as well I mean theoretical studies on the, yes. on the turbulence in these uh, Gianfranco Brunette and Vaza on these regions right so yes and the reacceleration issue as well so because they they also explore alternative mechanisms involving reconnection acceleration in order to explain this reacceleration in, in these more diluted regions far from the sources. Yeah, but yeah, it, it's amazing anyways to find out these uh, nearby radio galaxies whenever you can, I mean, whenever it's possible, right? So, yeah. yeah. By the way, like a funny story about this paper, I was writing a paper that was, I was going to be the first author on a paper that was going to be published in APJ. Uh, and then, like, as I was writing the paper, Ryan realized it, that the, there was that connection. Because he's been searching for that his entire, like, professional life. So he realized it, that there was that connection. And then we changed it, like, uh, uh, direction completely. It wasn't going to be an APJ paper anymore. 
it was going to be like uh, maybe uh, science or like uh, a nature astronomy paper. And, and because actually we were able to realize that like, look, there's a connection here. Uh, and then like we had this paper published in Nature Astronomy. And a couple of years later, I resumed the paper that I was writing back then. And I published that in APJ, but with an emphasis uh, on the X-ray emission. So, so that was a paper published in 2019 uh, on the same cluster, but like focusing on the X-ray data that we had. Anyway, that's a very interesting mm -hmm. cluster, indeed. Uh, uh, Eduardo has a question, but just to confirm, you showed the Mach number of the shocks is 1.2, I, I did see it right? Yeah, it's, oh, it's very, it's it's very low. Close to very close to one. Here's the thing, you, so here's what is really puzzling, like you would expect um, DSA, if you had like Mach numbers like of, of the order of 10, okay, but 1.4, 1.2, that, that's how how we thought, oh, look, like there's something weird about actually finding those relics if the shock points that we see in clusters are at most like two and three, right? So so for that range of, of MAC numbers, like we would expect it to be inefficient. So yeah, that's why then, we're very happy to see the connection uh, with the AGM for that particular. Case. Yes, and, and that's why you, you re rely on um, shock drift acceleration and yeah. also reconnection acceleration in the turbulent environment and uh, mechanisms like this. But yeah, that's true. Uh, please, Eduardo, please go ahead. So, Felipe, uh, my question is regarding the, the first part of the talk uh, where you mentioned that concentration parameter as a yeah. way to identify cool core and no cool core clusters. One of the things I've noticed, especially in the X-ray selected sample, is that uh, the population is not actually bimodal. There is no like a clear cut difference between cool clusters and non-cool cluster. Yeah. And the 0 0.4 is like a threshold you decided or someone decided for some reason, yeah. but uh, it's not like real, like not, not a- Yeah, uh, absolutely, it's a the, continuum distribution. The spectrum, yeah. So in that sense, wouldn't it more interesting to work is like a, a core coolness parameter, uh, which tells the degree on, on the how, how cool core, how cool is the core, or something like that, instead of dividing the sample between two uh, classes. Uh, yeah, like in, in the paper, we show the distribution of that parameters. Uh, we show the, what the distribution looks like. Uh, but we had to define like at some point what is a cool core or not for comparison between the two samples. So mm -hmm. I understand it's arbitrary uh, and, and, and that's like, uh, so some of the work was done, like we use it for different metrics. That was one, one of them. But basically the idea is like looking at simulations and looking uh, at those parameters um other like astronomers were able to identify where like you would try to put that like threshold to distinguish between them because you also from simulations have the temperature distribution so you could say like okay if the if the cooling uh radius of that cluster uh, meaning that the, the cooling time is below the hubble age uh is below a certain level it's a cool core. And then like from that, they sort of calibrate what the number should be. So they distinguish between cool core and non cool core. Other papers too, they have cool cores. They have like weak cool cores, strong cool cores and non cool cores. Mm. So they also divided more like uh, in, in more, uh, in more classes. So, so that I, I agree, I, it's arbitrary. Uh, but in order to do the work that we wanted to do, like see what is the fraction of cool cores, mm -hmm. we had to establish a certain number. Thank you. Hello, everybody froze. I can. But we still can. Yes, we can still listen to your voice.
don't know if uh, I don't know if, if Fibeti has another question or, or just uh, her hand is raised. So. No, I think she just forgot to exhibit. Can you hear us? I think it's adjusting the sounds. It's not a technical issue. We are so good. Alô? O que aconteceu? What happened? Okay. Agora estou. Ah, great, great. So uh, I would like to uh, thank Felipe again for your time, for sharing your research and knowledge. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Felipe, for this talk. And I would like to invite you and everyone present to continue connected uh, here in Google Meet for a, like a coffee, uh, coffee break now, some minutes to talk with Felipe if he has time to talk with us uh, informally. And I would like also to thank everyone following uh, the talk via Google Meets. And now we are going to finish the broadcast in YouTube, uh, Richard. I think we can.